Okay. So we, uh, can you share the link of the first uh, tutorial? Okay. I'm not sure whether you want to see the slides right now. I, I can definitely do that. Okay. Just uh, uh, give me, this is about the presentation. Just to share. Uh, so choose to change to everyone. Anyone with the link can view it. Okay. So, so for any of you who want to access the slides, you should be able to view it. Okay, so I talk about data, data structures in R. We learned two very important data structure in R. One is vector, which is a column values in the same data type, could be numeric, could be character, or even could be Boolean types. We also learned data frames. So data frame is more like, say you have multiple vectors, you know, more like you view each vector as a column. So you kind of concatenate them together and then that became a data frame. So I briefly mentioned there are other data types in R, which you might encounter, for instance, like list or even matrix. But for now, I mean, that's focused on the two most important one, which is vector and a data frame, which we're gonna interact a lot. And uh, then we talked a little bit about the R Studio and the R, which is the toolkit that we are going to use to, which we are going to do R programming. And uh, so let's try to open our R Studio again. So I do briefly mention a workflow problem here. So imagine you work on a project on Wednesday and you close your, all your software, you maybe shift to work on other R projects. And when you reopen it again, for instance, like this one, I'm not sure whether you can still see some data sets, the Forbes 2000, which you kind of imported in the previous session. And if you didn't see them, or if you see them, that's, that's kind of depending on how R Studio might save your kind of working space. And uh, say, imagine you open this R, R, R tutorial script, and you notice that your working directory gonna kind of sometimes they're gonna be reset back to the default, which gonna be your documentation, uh, which usually gonna be the document folder, which is no longer the working directory that you set. So maybe for each time you have to click this, you have reset your working directory. Otherwise, that's just give it a try. So I kind of start a new session, brand new. You can see my environment have nothing in it. And uh, my R Studio console also has nothing as well. So this is the code I copied from previous session when I try to import the data. So suppose I just uh, open this script, I want to rerun everything and see what we might encounter. So I load the library and then I want to read the CSV. Boom, immediately you see something. There's an error message saying the Forbes 2000 CSV does not exist in your current working directory because my current working directory was reset kind of to my default location. So there are a couple of ways. I mean, working with directory can be a little bit, you know, not easy for beginners who are not very familiar with those file paths. But I want to point you to uh, some, some kind of more useful ways which can help you to kind of work on this issue in case you have to, you know, work on this project, you know, multiple times, you have to pick it up a few times. So one way you can do that is under the session, there is a set working directory to source file location, meaning that, okay, please go to the file location, say where this script is saved. Well, I mean, that's one way you can do that, but I strongly recommend you to do is trying to create an R project. So let's create an R project together. I mean, that's actually a very good workflow in terms of if you are working on the R pro projects, you have all the documents, your data, your analysis all in one place, right? So let's try to create an R project, trying to you know, really fix the path issues without doing a lot of coding. So what we're gonna do, it is if you go to your file, there's something called new projects. So if you click your new projects 
And you actually, you actually can either create a, a project from a new directory, or actually you also can do that from a existing directory. We're gonna do that because we already create our folder for this tutorial session. So I will choose existing directory and I'm going to pick the folder, which is gonna be in my download folder. This is the R Tutorial Field Institutes. And then I'm going to click open. So this is gonna be my project working directory. And then just to do create, create projects. And by doing this, immediately you see your working directory has been changed to this project. And you also see a new file being created under your folder. This is R, P-R-O-G stands for R project. So this file actually gonna contain your working directory and you, you don't have to configure the working directory every time. But however, if you, are, if you receive an R script from somewhere else, you want to try it out, you, you probably have to working on this directory fairly commonly. But if this is your own project, you want to have everything well organized in one place, you better create an R project. It, it will help you easily manage the working directory and the file paths. So again, I'm going to open my R to, R tutorial R script. And, uh, and if you want to make sure you are on the right kind of file path, they say R can find your data. You also can do get WD. I think it's, uh, yeah, oh, oh, it should be get WD. It means get my working directory, right? So tell me my current working directory is it actually shows up to be my project folder. And this data set is actually located under this folder. So that's why this time you won't encounter any problem. I mean, this is just a more like a workflow for your own, pro for your own project, given you know, path, file path can be quite intimidating to manage, I think for beginners. Okay, so we have our project set up. We have the folder. And, and uh, you already see there's something existed. So that's just to try to make sure we have our data sets in here. So I kind of just select all these three lines. You can either use the shortcut to control enter or you can click this uh, button here to run the line or run the selected lines. And last time we did, we can call function like head to take a look at the first few rows, we can check the dimension, which is the number of rows and columns of a data frame. And also we can call the names function to get all the columns of this, of this data sets. And we also can call the STR stands for structure to look at for each of the column, what is their data type and also have how many values in here. So that's kind of where we uh, stopped in the previous session. Okay, so once you get the data, I just want to uh, mention one function I think may be very handy for you to use, It is called summary. So if I want to get a summary of all the columns, I can directly call summary and the pass by data framing. If I run it, you actually will get a summary of your data sets for each of the column, depending on the data type. You, for numeric value, you probably got get, you, you will actually get the minimum, maximum, and also uh, percentile. For character type, you usually just get the length and also what is the mode and the type of the data. I think this can be handy as a first look at your basic dis descriptive statistics of your, day, day of your data. So there are a lot of functions in base R. Unfortunately, given the length of the tutorial session, I won't be able to cover. But I mean, in short, the base R actually allow you to do a lot of things. For instance, if you want to calculate, if you want to select some columns or you want to subset the data, or even you want to do some 
uh, data aggregation to calculate the mean, median, or even maximum or minimum, you can do that in BASAR without using any package. Okay, so package is actually something gonna make things easy or even give you more functionality. But I think for, for very basic things, you can trust the base R, which gonna, which actually uh, is a, is able to do most of that. I mean, however, given this session, we're gonna talk about uh, the package tidyverse. So I'm going to shift my gear to R packages. Okay, so for our packages, I do want to give you an overview of that. So this is the R package. I think how you should view our packages is, is you can view our packages as similar to apps in your app store. If you, if you are using iOS or if you are using Android phone, it's more like a Google Play Store. And the, most of the R packages were developed by third-party developers. And uh, just like any app you use on your phone, you always have to install it first before you can use it, right? You go to the app store, click the button install before you can use any, any app, like say Facebook or even Twitter, if you are using any of that. And currently in the comprehensive R R archive network, which is, a package repository for all the R packages. There are over 18,000 packages. You can view them at, okay, there are roughly over 18 apps on the app store of kind of R. And for any package you're gonna use in your project or your code, and if you haven't installed it, you need to do so. You only need to do it once. And once you install it, that doesn't mean you can use it right away. You just like when you want to use any app on your phone, you always have to click that app first. And that click is equivalent to your calling this line of code. It means library, and then with the parentheses, you put your package name in, meaning that I'm going to use and load this package because I'm going to use functions inside that package. And in order to install the R package, we typically call the function install.packages. We pass the package's name. You actually can pass a list if you want to install multiple. Uh, okay, and uh, given that we're gonna talk about tidyverse a little bit. So tidyverse package is one package in that big repository. A repos repository. What makes tidyverse special is just that Tidyverse is actually not kind of one package. It's kind of like a bundled package. So inside Tidyverse, if you click install package, what it will do is that it, it actually gonna install all these packages just in one command. So Tidyverse ensured it is a collection of package allow you to do, for instance, very basic data wrangling. You're gonna use Dippler a lot also allow you to do some plotting with the ggplot2. And if you have to uh, process some text data, which they do have string R, allow you to process very complex text data. And it's also have table, which some additional data frame, this package gonna provide to you. And also with the pipe, uh, with the percentage sign. And as you can see here, so this is also something very powerful, allow you to, create a pipeline of kind, kind of data process steps. And uh, for today's session, for the remaining 40 minutes, we actually gonna focus on the Diffler package, which is within the, tide, within the Tidyverse package. So what this package gonna allow you to do is we, we actually gonna do very basic data wrangling like filter day data, subset data, and also do some very basic summaries, including the use of group by. And hopefully we are able to cover the pipe operator. And also if time allows, I will also show some use case of the ggplot2 package as well. Okay, so I'm going to uh, shift back to our studio. So that's stuff from here. So like I said, if you haven't 
install tidyverse, you so install first, right? Before use. You can do install the packages and you have to pass a text, right? Say tidyverse. So once you write this command, it's meaning that I'm going to install tidyverse. And uh, you, you can see the line of code has been copied into my console and uh, it, it, it says the package was successfully unpacked. And uh, please note that you only need to do it once, okay? So given that this is a package installation, very typically we're gonna put it in the in the front of our, our script, because we always gonna load the package before we use this function, right? Given that I already installed it, I will just mark this line. So I, I don't have to uh, worry about rerunning this same command line. Again, given I'm going to use the functions inside this package, I have to do the one click to open it, right? It's gonna be library.tidyverse. And this is the moment when I'm trying to load the functions or even packages inside the tidyverse package so I can call the functions inside. You, you, you actually can see there are a number of packages which have been loaded. Okay, so now I am all good. I have installed the package. I also click to open my library. And then I'm going to start from here. I'm going to kind of uh, use the tidyverse package. The first thing we are going to learn, so there are a handful of functions I think you're gonna use if you, if you want to do very basic data analysis. I mean, the first one we are going to try out, it is how we can select columns. They select columns. The reason for that is, for instance, if you are working on survey data, or even you might experience working on very large health data sets, they might have over hundreds, say, variables. Typically for your own project, you probably don't need to use all of them. You're probably gonna uh, use a subset of that. So for first step, you probably only wanna gonna select the column or variable which are relevant to your research or to your project. So how can we do that? So the function, so select column, we use the select function in deeper. So please note that this uh, deeper is actually one of the package in tidyverse. So that's why I, I call the specific function rather than the tidyverse, but you know this is one package in, tide, in tidyverse. So that's, that's try it out. So if we want to just to select a few columns, we can call the selector function. So I will do select. And uh, the first parameter you, you're gonna give to this function is which data frame you are going to select from, right? In our case, it actually gonna be Forbes 2000. And then always the first parameter is your data, data frame. Say so select data from Forbes 2000 and then followed by the column that you are interested in. So suppose I only want to take a look at the name and the sales. So where are, are they from? So if you remember, we checked about the names, right? So I just ran this line of code, which tell me all the columns. So I can tell there's a name column. I can tell there is a sales column, right? So I kind of pick these two. You, you, you actually can pick other columns. You don't have to add the double quotes here. And then given that I'm doing a subsetting of the data frame, I'm going to save my data sets 
as a data data frame one. That's just uh, you know play with it. As as I said, if you want to reuse anything, you need to use variables to save your results. And the select function gonna give you a new data frame. So let's see whether what we get. I, I just ran the code. I can tell there's a df one. A data frame, a new data frame has been uh, created and showed up in my environment. And you also can double click it. You can actually view there are only two columns being selected. I mean, this is the first, uh, first kind of function you can use. And you always can call the head df1 if you want to take a look at the first, uh, say, six rows of this data frame, you are free to do so just by call the hat. I kind of just mark it as well. And the other thing you probably want to do, you want to reorganize the order of the column, right? Say for instance, you, you, if you want say the name and the sales to be the first and the second column of your data frame while the remaining column just gonna be followed after these two col columns, you actually can add a slightly, you actually can add one parameter inside this select function. So let me show it to you. So I would just call it df2. It's going to be, it's going to be select again from my Forbes 2000 with the name, with the sales and everything. So everything gonna actually pick the remaining of the column. Say this time we are not doing subsetting. We are just reorganizing the sequence of the column, kind of like that. I, I run it again. You can see the new data frame is here. If you click it, you can find the name and the cell to be the first and the second column of this data frame, while with the remaining one to be kept in their original orders. I mean, this is about uh, select. I will see. This is about re kind of ordering the columns. Okay, so moving on to the next one. So very often you may want to change the column names, right? This is also fairly common. So if you have column names, which you want to change or rename it to something different, you actually can use the function in tidyverse package to rename it as well. The function name is very intuitive, just re, it's just rename. And let's take a look at the names of our Forbes 2000 data sets again. So we have nine columns here, and we know the name in our data frame refers to the company name, right? Say, I want to rename the name column to be company. And I can use the rename. Again, I'm going to save it in the new data frame. I call it DF3. And this time I'm going to rename. You can call the function again. You have to pick the data frame first to be the first parameter for this function. Again, we are operating on the Forbes 2000. Okay, so I'm going to rename the name column to be country. So I will put my new name uh, 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 to be company, I'm sorry. This is the company, which is gonna be a new name. And this is the old name I want to replace. I want to replace the old name, name with a new name, company. And then I'm going to call names df3. I want to print out all the column names. I'm going to run this 
PF3 first and then check the names and see the column, the original name column was kind of renamed into the company col column and I save it in the new data frame. Okay, so that's two function. We learn select, we learn rename. The next function I want to introduce, it is we want to filter data. We want to filter rows. So imagine you are working on a cohort study. You, you're probably gonna have specific inclusive or even exclusive criteria for your cohort. In that case, you get the raw data you're probably gonna tease out some of the, some of the observ uh, observations based on your inclusive or exclusive criteria. In that case, you might want to use a function filter to, fil to filter the raw data to get a subset of the data which kind of match your criteria for your cohort study. And to filter the rows, and we are going to use the filter function. I think the function name in tidyverse or Diplur are quite intuitive. And uh, suppose, so this is gonna be my ask. So I want to get a new data frame uh, in which The country is Japan or, and the category is banking, right? So I want to take a look at all the companies in Japan and the category belongs to banking. So this is more like I filter the original data frame. The way I can do that is again to use a filter. I'm going to create my DF4. I'm going to save it in the new data frame. As you can guess, function name followed by my data frame name, right? And why it's come to filter, it relates to the comparison operator and also uh, multiple, con and I think it's related to the com comparison operator as well as whether you want to, if you have multiple, con multiple condition you want to match, there's also how you're gonna handle all these conditions. And that actually gonna relate it to uh, some new operators. So they actually exist in many programming language. In case you don't know them, so I do want to give you a mini cheat sheet for that. Say if you want to filter data and very often you're gonna use the comparison operator if you want to say whether the country equals to Japan for comparison purpose, you should use the double equal sign. Or if you want any companies, you, uh, all you want all the companies not in Japan, you can use the not equal which is a uh, exclamation mark with the equal sign. Or for numeric value, you're probably gonna use either greater than, uh, greater than, less than, or, e or greater than or equal to. So these are your choice of comparison operators. Well, the other thing, it is called Boolean operators. So suppose you have two conditions. You want the companies in Japan and, and we are going to use a ampersand sign in R in order to indicating both condition need to be true and the category is in banking. So if you're gonna use say, I want either country in Japan or category in banking, then you will use the bar to indicate the or condition. So if you have multiple conditions, you're gonna use uh, the and or in conjunction with some comparison operator. 
again, I'm going to give you an example to illustrate this. Going to shift back to my R Studio. So what we want is country is Japan and the category is banking. So right after your data frame, you are going to put your conditions, right? Say, so how can I specify country is Japan? It's actually very intuitive. Please note that we are filtering our original data frame. So uh, oh, yeah, I, I, th I, think, I think the country is fine. This is the right name. It should be country. I say it need to be Japan and uh, we need to use the double equal sign. Please know if you're, if you're only using one equal sign, you are assigning value to something, right? If you want to compare something, you need to use the double equal sign. And this time I'm going to say country equal to Japan, as I said, and so both conditions have to be met in this case. And then I'm going to add the ampersand to indicate this is the end of the condition. While the category, again, equals to, double equal sign, to banking. And then I'm, I'm going to run this line, no error. I can see the new data frame four has been created with 69 observations. There are 69 companies who are in Japan, belongs to the banking industry. You can see that all the categories are in banking, the country is in Japan. I'm going to save my script file before I work on another run. So I want to give you one little exercise. Say whether you can find the companies uh, where the rank is between 100 and 150, including 100 and 150. Okay, so I will give you a moment to work on this, see whether you can kind of copy the syntax here, be able to do it by yourself. Once you are done, you are free to copy paste your code in the chat. Another exercise gonna be say find uh, the data. Uh, say filter the data. Let me just say, filter the data where market value is no five. Okay. Anyone want to copy and paste your solution in the chat?
please enter three in the chat to let me know you are working on it. Yeah, I want to make sure whether I'm running too fast or some of you may have trouble to follow. I, I, I just want to do a very quick attention check. So if you are still working on it, you'll need a little bit more time. Enter three in the chat to let me know. Yeah, I see uh, Linari figured it out. Great. So which is about uh, the rank. Let me just uh, run it. Okay, it runs fine. Data frame has been created. I can see the rank is 100. If I sort it, the maximum is 150. Good job. Good job. I didn't get any reply in the chat, so I am I am not quite sure. So in case if you find I'm running a little bit too fast, please let me know. Okay. Okay, so for filter the data frame where market value is between this range, I'm going to do DF6 and filter Bob's 2000. I'm going to say, okay, I get another one from Somaya. I hope I say your name right. Okay, good. I think I will just copy your solution here. I'm going to name it DF6 filter. Uh, oops. It says market value. So, that, that's just run, run it first to see. It, it actually says there are some unexpected symbols. The reason for that is for our column, the market value doesn't have a space in it. So we have to be precise in terms of to have the column name matched. And I will remove the space in between. And uh, it actually says, ah, that's the other thing. So if you want to do both, you have to write them explicitly. So this is one condition, right? And followed by another condition, right? So should be less than 50, right? Okay. Okay, this time the code is working fine. So moving on to the next function, it is suppose we want to sort our data. Say we want to sort all the rows for different column. One way you can do that is if you kind of click the corresponding column in the view panel, you should be able to sort it accordingly. However, there are times you do want your data frame, your original data frame to be sort, sorted by certain columns, you actually can arrange or sort rows with the ar arrange function. So for arrange function, it can take a data frame and a set of column names and have the data sorted either in ascending or descending order by the columns that you specified. To give you one example, suppose I want to sort, I want to sort the data frame by category and market value. So if I want to sort my data frame by category, 
and the market value. How can I do that? So given that you already use quite a few packages, uh, quite, quite a few functions in this package, you kind of can predict its patterns, right? Again, for the arrange, right after the range, the first parameter always gonna be the data frame. So I kind of can guess that, right? Actually, yes, the answer should be, you're gonna put your data frame as the first parameter in this function. There are additional things you need to put in here because you want to sort the data frame by these two columns. Then you put the column one after another, and then you comma separate them, right? Market value. And I'm going to save it again in a DF7. I do a range. This is the Forbes 2000 with the category and the market value. Okay, I just ran the code. Let me take a look at my DF7. It should be sorted in category, which you can see uh, for capture column, it was sorted uh, by uh, alphabetically. And for market value, you can see it is also in ascending order by default if it is numeric value, right? So what if I want to sort the category in descending order, but the market value in ascending order? I'm going to create a DF8. Say add a comment, say sort in descending order. I can do again with the arrange. Ops 2000, I'm going to sort it in descending order. I can use the, the function DSC for the category in, meaning that I'm going to sort it in descending order for the category. And still keep the market value just as it is because default, the default sorting order is ascending order, right? And then I'm going to run it again. I take a look at my DF8 again here. You can see the category starts with the first character to you, which is the utility, while the market value is still in ascending order. So this is how you may sort your data frame. The next thing is that often for your own data sets, you're probably gonna derive some new columns uh, with the use of existing column in your data frame. For instance, if, if you have, say, you have the market value, you have the sales for each company in this data sets, suppose you want to derive a new column named the price to sales ratio, and you can create a new column, create new columns, with the use of mutate function. Say this is the mutate function is for new column creation. So this time, suppose we want to create the, the price to uh, the price to sales ratio. And uh, the equation should be market value divided sales. And what we can do is that, again, I'm going to create a new data frame, df9. I'm going to call the mutate function. It's gonna be mutate price to sales ratio. And equals to market value divided sales. So make sure your column name are specified correctly. Okay, market value is not found. Let me check. Oh yeah, so what I'm missing here. So for all the for all these very basic functions in Dipler, you always specify the data frame first, right? 
it, it should be Fubus Bob's 2000. I've, I've, got, I've got to put it in. And this time, let's, let's see whether we can get it right. There's no error message, DF9, with the mutate. I can take a look at here. So price to sale ratio, you, you can see this new column has been added. And we save this new data frame in a new variable named the DF9. Okay, the last one I'm going to introduce, it is often we're gonna calculate some summary st statistics. For instance, we want to calculate the mean by different groups, or we want to use the aggregate function. For instance, like say mean and a sum and, and the even max. Say I want to calculate the total market value by different category, for instance. So typically I also need to group by, by certain columns before I calculate the aggregate functions. So suppose we want to calculate the total market value, say calculate, calculate the total market value by category. So we know each company belong to a particular in industry sector. So we want to calculate the total market value by category. So there are two functions you're gonna use. One is group by. So this is, you have to specify for which column you, you want to group by. So given this example, we want it to be by the category. And then for the aggregate functions, if you want to use mean, we can use the summarize functions in conjunction with the aggregate functions to derive this. So in short, you need to use two functions to calculate the total, mar total market value by categories. Again, so let me give you one example, which is gonna be First of all, I'm going to create my group, right? Which is gonna be by category. This is a new variable I create. And what it does, it is I'm going to call the group by to specify the categories or specify the column I want things to be grouped by. Again, the first the column gonna be Forbes 2000. It's our data frame. And uh, the column I, I want to group by by is the category column. After I do that, I want to say, I, cal I want to calculate the market value by category. So again, this is a new variable. I'm going to save my results. And this time I'm going to use the summarize, right? This is my final results that I'm looking for. Given that I want my summary statistics to be grouped by, by category column, I can just pass my group by, which is the by category as the first parameter. And then I'm going to create, then I'm going to create, uh, then I'm going to calculate the sum of the market value which should be kind of some market value. This is the column, this is the sum. Given that this, this should be a kind of a new column in my result table, I am just going to give it a name saying this should be sum market value equals to sum. So again, for the summary, uh, for the summarize function, you specify your by category, which is from your group by, and then specify what you want to calculate, which is the sum of market value. 
And given this new value, you want to specify a column name for it, which is going to be some market value in this case. So I'm just going to run these two lines. And you can see my new data frame has been created, named the uh, market value by category. I just click it. You can see for each of the category, this is some of the market value. So there are a total of 27 categories. And we just calculate, we just uh, calculated the total market value for each kind of sector. So I think that's all for today's tutorial session. Just to summarize and recap what I have showcased. So we practice five key deeper functions in Tidyverse allow you to solve the vast majority of your data manipulation challenges for a initial data processing stage. I, I didn't talk about any st st statistical models so you might need to use additional package to do that. But, but as a starting place, we learned how we can pick columns by column name and the filter observ observations by their values, reorder the rows, as well as create new column with the use of existing variables in your data sets. At last, we briefly talk about how you can calculate a summary by different groups. We, we, we use the group by function together with the summarize. Because we don't have time right now, so I just want to briefly call out the pipe operator. So what the pipe operator is doing is actually allow you to kind of concatenate multiple steps you're going to do in your data cleaning process into one single kind of line of code. So you can actually chain the steps you are going to do in your data analysis. And also there's, uh, there are times you're gonna do a lot of plotting. You may want to check up, you might want to take a look at the ggplot2 package as well as their cheat sheets to learn a little bit more about how you might do data visualization in R. At last, I want to highlight a few resource. One is called R Studio Cheat Sheets on this website. So if you want to use Diffler, which is the one we used, you actually can take a, take a look at the entire cheat sheet by downloading this one. For each of the function I just talked about, they have very good visual. So you can quickly make sense, uh, make sense of what each of the function is doing. There are many more in this package. And uh, for Tidyverse, there's also one cheat sheet about it. And uh, if you need to use, service, if you want to do specific steps, you don't know how, you may use the cheat sheet to help you find useful functions. And also I want to point out this article data science book, which is free online and uh, which have a lot of examples related to how you might use all the packages in the tidyverse. At last, I mean, often you're gonna encounter tasks that you don't know how you should be able to tackle that. One recommendation gonna be, it, it is actually very common even for me just to type my question, you know, in Google. And then often there, the answers or the web page show up on the front of your search gonna be a website named the Stack Overflow. And once in a while, I, I would also say very often, I also need to ask Google and look for answers uh, on Stack Overflow. I mean, searching or even learning, I think it is fairly common. So if you are new to R. I think that's all for today's session. I mean, if you have any questions, you are feel free to ask. 
And uh, otherwise, I mean, that's all. You should be able to access the slides. If you want to have a copy of the R code, I can send it to Dr. Osgood and Dr. Osgood can distribute it, the R script to you. Thank you everyone for attending.